Meta search, restaurant reservations, hotel booking juggernaut. Our next speaker has a growing portfolio of brands whose gross bookings totaled more than $50 billion in 2014. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Darren Houston, President and CEO of the Priceline Group and CEO of Booking.com. Hey, Douglas. Hi, hey, thank you. I guess I've got to hang on to this mic. Something happened between back. Oh, really? Okay. So it's going to be me, you, and me, you, and the mic. Sounds great. Okay. All right. So uh, you know, we've been talking a lot about consolidation uh, over, uh, well, not just at this conference, but you know, over the, the year uh, with in this industry, and a lot of talk about about. Um, consolidation among OTAs, but in fact yeah. we just saw uh, what is now going to be the biggest hotel combination uh, with Marriott and Starwood. Not a lot of discussion about that at the conference so far. Yeah. And I'd like to get your reaction to that. Is this good for, for the Priceline Group, bad for the Priceline Group? Well, we have a, we have a great relationship with Marriott, uh, with Arnie Shafiq, who runs distribution. And, uh, and they're really great, honest players. We do a lot of great business together. You know, the global chains only make up 10% of our business. Uh, we're quite diversified. Uh, that's both. It's a, a net state commission uh, comment. So uh, I think it could be good. I mean, there is one thing that is needed uh, in the hotel industry is continued diversity. And as long as the W can maintain being the W and the Marriott can continue to be the Marriott and they're able to manage that portfolio to continue to give customers diverse experiences, then it should be a really good thing. Um, and I certainly welcome it. So, uh, but I want to read this quote that uh, uh, that Barry Sternlich, the founder yeah. of Starwood Hotels, made. I think yeah. on, on Bloomberg on Monday, uh, he said the scale of this merger was done to fight the OTAs and also the potential threat of Airbnb. So, look, I mean, you you come here you know, year after year, and, and Dara and, and Steve Kaufer and others, and it seems like everything is chummy between all of you in the hotels. But yeah. I mean, clearly. Uh, the hotels have a different, a different take on, on this. What do you think of Barry's comments? Well, you know, our, our interests are very aligned with people who own hotels. We're the least expensive way for them to generate new demand. Our customers generally are very transient. Uh, the customers who are coming back to the same hotel over and over and over again and who are doing the miles and all of that is a different customer base. We're marketing in 42 languages around the world. Nobody has to work with us, but it seems to work. Um, and I'm, I'm proud of what we do, so I continue to focus on what we can control. And, um, and I feel good. I mean, our relationship and our business with all the major chains is growing very fast. And I think that also reflects the nature of, of the opening up of the hotel industry. How, do, how does the, the scale, how do you think the scale of this new combined group, how, how could that just affect the dynamics of you know, when your teams are sitting on the, on the opposite side of the table with, with their teams in terms of working together? Uh, not a lot, to be honest. You know, most of our, our searchers are like hotel in Barcelona. And unless you own every hotel in Barcelona, your, your result is not as relevant to a selection where you have all the hotels, all the alternative accommodations, all of the vacation rentals, and then you answer the question. And that's kind of the primary source of of our business, Dara's business. So there's a need for that kind of play in this industry. It's still quite fragmented. Um, but I, honestly, I welcome it. I think, uh, I think Marriott, for instance, they're, they're great operators. I think they'll bring a lot of discipline on the portfolio, and that helps us. As long as they can continue to give our guests great experiences, that's a real positive uh, in our relationship. So uh, you talked about uh, vacation rentals, yeah. and this has been growing uh, quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, what's your view on Expedia's acquisition of uh, HomeAway? A lot of speculation that uh, you may have been yeah. uh, interested at one point and talk about a possible acquisition by, by the Priceline Group. I know you can't speak yeah. about that, but what's your reaction? Is that a, a more competitive for you? Well, you know, when I first arrived at Booking.com, we were a hotel booking uh, company, and that still is our primary business. but. In the last four years, we've been building out an alternative accommodation portfolio. And as we were doing that, we just get further and further down what I call the hotel pyramid, and you eventually end up in vacation rental land, like single homeowner, single property, apartments in Paris. And three years ago, I might have needed more help, but we've continued along the path of building out this fee-free, frictionless 
booking experience that makes booking a vacation rental like booking a hotel room. There's some that may believe that we'll never get to the end of that, that the last home in the world will not want to be booked that way. I believe differently. I think that's where the puck is moving, and that's what we're working towards. And we built that business. I think you know, I built that business with 20 people, and if it's worth $4 billion, um, they should all get a big bonus this year uh, for the work that's been done, because we have now 6.6 .6 million rooms in the alternative accommodation space. That's three times more than any of our nearest competitors, and we're, we're adding 1,000 properties a day. But, but a lot of that is actually professionally managed, so it's condo hotels or multi-unit multi -unit properties, right? So it's more, in a lot of cases more like hotels, really, than a kind of Airbnb or you know, renting a, a privately owned home. Yeah, you'd be surprised. I mean, I, I, I sit in an office in Rembrandt Square in Amsterdam, and four years ago I looked out and there were like four hotels to stay at. When I have the map now, we have like 50 places to stay, and it's all sorts of stuff. And I go through consumer ratings. There's a, a beautiful one they call Hotel Tune, but it's only got two rooms. But it's a nine and a half out of 10. And I'm like, that's a great experience. So this, this world of alternative accommodations is big and broad, and it's not just property management. People want to position it that way, but if you go to book a room in New York or in Paris or, frankly, the north of Norway and you want to sleep in an igloo, that's the kind of stuff that we want to have bookable on Booking.com, and that's what we've been building. But, but how do you solve that, uh, that instant booking yeah. and confirmation problem? Because you still have all of these homeowners that they want to list on Airbnb yeah. and HomeAway and Flipkey and many yeah. other sites, and they may want to have the option of rejecting a, a reservation yeah. request. So how do you, what's your strategy for dealing with that? Well, what you need to have is you need to have a digital calendar and you need to be able to commit to selling something when you say it's for sale. That's not that big a request. Like, that's the way the economy works. Usually, if you list something, you say it's for sale, and here's the price. You're not supposed to have to go through another period. Well, I was kind of just kidding. And, oh, George Clooney's house isn't available, so we're going to put you at the one right beside it. Like, that's not, that's not normal. And, and we're working with that basic belief. And, I, and from all of our experience, we're finding that we can go deeper and deeper. It could be a two-year, a three-year, a five-year journey, but the on-request model doesn't convert. It's, and you can't, with an on-request model, you have to charge the consumer fees. And I think a fee-free model for consumers that really takes the friction out of the booking experience is going to be the winning model at the end of the day. And that's what we're betting on. And if we're wrong, we're wrong. But we're the only player basically going from the hotel, alternative accommodations, and down the stack. And I, from what I see anyway, it converts way better. We can bid in Google on it. We know that somebody's booked. And so I, I asked this question to Brian uh, Sharples ye yesterday. And I want to get your thoughts. How do you think about the merchandising of this inventory? You know, it really yeah. used to be, OK, if I want to rent a home, I can go to HomeAway or vacation rental sites. If yeah. I'm looking for a hotel, I go to a hotel site yeah. or I go to yeah an online travel agency. Yeah. But you know, yours is the, in booking.com, is the site that's really moved forward where I can in certain, yeah. I can have displays where I can see yeah. uh, a, a, a chain, I can see a core, I can see an independent hotel, a B&B, &B, and I can see you know, Joe's apartment right yeah. in, the, yeah. in the same display. How do, you, how do you think about that from a merchandising perspective? What, what have you learned that, that uh, Expedia hasn't? Well, 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 we learned, I mean, it's certainly every vertical you went into, there were vertical players, B&Bs, uh, hostels. You know, every one that you come across, you're like, God, that'll never work on this site. And then you have to work on A-B experimentation, optimization. We have a whole team on alternative accommodations. How do we take the friction out? Do you really need a bank transfer? Why do you always need Saturday to Saturday? What about Sunday to Sunday? You know, can you book this home for one night versus two nights, five nights, seven nights? And as we've gone down the pyramid and added more and more types of accommodation, we're able to take the friction out. And, and by the power of bringing demand to those properties, they will adjust their models because we teach them how to get more customers. And that's been the journey. It wasn't obvious that we would make it all the way, but as you just keep grinding away at it, you realize that what people are looking for when you go to Barcelona, Berlin, you're looking for a place to stay that matches your needs. All of these other categorizations frankly, aren't critical. They're more historical. So do you, do you see any significant differences in that rental customer versus the, uh, the hotel customer? 
Yeah, for sure. I mean, the, if you go, say, to a vacation home, it might be a family that would have otherwise rented three double rooms. But you're saying, hey, you can have a whole home, you know, and, and it's actually a really good deal. It's like an upgrade for the family. Then you say, well, why didn't they end up in a home? It's, well, it's because there's so much friction. If you're like traveling from Vancouver, Canada, and you're ending up in Barcelona, previously you just wouldn't do the home thing because it's a classified ad, you'd have to talk to somebody, they speak Spanish, you speak English, blah, blah, blah. But if the family can see that and they can see all the accommodation, like, wow, three double rooms or do we want the home on the beach for the exact same price? It's, it, for most people, it's an upgrade. So people find their way to match what they need through filtering and sorting. Uh, very much on their own. And, and for any single person, depending on the scenario, you could end up picking something very different. Darren, we have a question. Hi, Darren. Oh, hey, Phil. Uh, with all the change going on, Steve Kalfer was eloquent yesterday about the importance of preparing employees for change and unexpected change constantly. And uh, Dara sort of agreed when Lorraine asked him, does never mean next year and he smiled and said yes. So I've tried to explain people your advice about being humble and being yeah. fast, but I don't quite do it justice. I thought maybe you could share some of your wisdom. Yeah, well, I always tell our employees, all we are is people and servers, and servers are dumb. So the whole company is created by people, and in that respect, there's so much change going on in our industry that the, every time I go through the math, all I, can, I keep coming back to the same conclusion. Guys, what we're doing is right, but, but time is short. We need to move faster. And in our industry, which is very different than hard goods e-commerce, we're delivering our service through our partners. And if we don't remain humble, and if we become arrogant, and if the power balance changes, then they're not going to want to do business with us, and that's ultimately going to hurt end consumers. So, so change is a constant. Um, the great thing is, you know, our workforce is on average 30, 29 years old. That generation really embraces the change. In fact, they're hunger for the change and they want to be empowered to make and innovate ver against a backdrop like that. They appreciate the speed and the change and they really rally to that kind of message. So I always say that, hungry and humble, because people will come to me and go, oh, Expedia bought this, and TripAdvisor did that, and Google's going to do that. And I'm like, guys, focus on the road ahead. Don't look in the rearview mirror. You guys have the winning model, but faster, faster, faster. You know, I often say, hurry, don't rush, because rushing means you make way too many mistakes, but let's get at it and make it happen. And, I, and that's what really drives our organization forward. Thank you. So speaking of, of change, yeah. I think I'd like to know what changed with, with TripAdvisor and yeah. with, with instant booking. Steve Kaufer yesterday, uh, he, he kind of, he was very cautious of, about what he said he, and really talked about compromise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I asked him who won, who over. <laughs> well, you know, it's in, in the world of technology, you can, you can have multiple winners. I mean, if you're not comfortable with coopetition, you shouldn't be in this business. Um, I'm not here to hurt anyone. We're just trying to do our jobs well. And we're an advertiser, so we wanted to buy a product, and we said, I don't want to be a dumb pipe. I'm not going to just give rates and availability. I don't want my content to sell my competitor's product. I just need great marketing. I need secure content. And I need the ability to brand the entire experience. And if you can give me that, and I know that I can take a shot at getting the next customer, the next customer, the next customer, then, then I feel comfortable with it. And we came to, I think, a good compromise. And I'm, I'm proud of it because we can now use this example for all the other metas and others we play with. You want to play with the Priceline group? This is what it takes if you want to do an XML3 path, which is what instant booking is. I don't think instant booking is going to change the world, to be honest, but that's the media owner's decision. The media owner gets to say what they want to do, and as an advertiser, his biggest advertiser, I get to say what I'm willing to pay for, and that's the nature of those conversations. So, well, Darren, well, Darren, we have another question from okay. the audience. Sure. Right here, straight ahead. Hi, thank you. I'm Austin Brooks with Mariana's Fund Management. Yeah. And um, my question is kind of uh, one of the, is Google going to do that? Um, and what we saw this morning and what we've seen from Google for a couple of years now is an attempt to drive direct bookings with hotels. Um, and one of their largest partners, as you guys are, I guess, how, how do you feel about this? How are you reacting to this? And how do you see the ecosystem changing 
in the next two to three years with Google's continued efforts? Thank you. Easy question. Yeah, exactly. 10, 15 seconds. Well, you know, it's, it always, what I, have, I take a lot of comfort in, Google doesn't want to do the work we do. So we invite them to our office to meet the 6,000 customer service reps who speak 42 languages. We have 178 offices around the world working with hotels, getting pricing, getting great availability. They know we're a huge advertiser, so they want more of our money. And that's what they do. And they want to invite hotels in as well so that the auction is hot, that the hotels are bidding and we're bidding and everyone's bidding. I mean, I, I sense that's the end game. Um, and but we're can I just, but I know everyone is bidding, but you know, you've got a slightly bigger uh, war chest than all those hotels, right, to do that bidding. Well, it all depends on the nature of the search. And you ha tend to have a few more servers, from what I understand as well. We have a number of servers. <laughs> But, um, but yeah, I, we just move forward. We have a great relationship with Google. We've helped design some of the ads. We're active in hotel price ads. And we, we just play it forward. But I, and I, I actually feel very positive. They're the best marketing engine in the entire world. And we're one of the best buyers of their product. And we try to keep getting better. We actually recently parked an RV in Google's parking lot. Um, so we could actually be in Silicon Valley and work on product together. So I, I cherish our relationship. We're not dumb. Uh, we, we don't want our content to sell other people's product. But we're constantly innovating together. And, and I think they understand that as well. So I want to talk a bit about OpenTable. I think that acquisition now is about two years. Two years uh, about a year and a half. Yeah, a year yeah. and a half. So enormous amount of expectations, a lot yeah. of excitement. So. I, we were all expecting to have, you know, yeah. personalized restaurant recommendations yeah. integrated with our Booking.com yeah. and our Priceline mm -hmm. experience, yeah. and uh, hasn't quite uh, mm -hmm. materialized, or it's hard mm -hmm. to see where the integration mm -hmm. is. Yeah. And yesterday, uh, Dara of, of Expedia yeah. was asked a, a question: You know, is Expedia going to follow Priceline and, and TripAdvisor and get into yeah. uh, the restaurant and, yeah. and dining sector? And he said, you know, he doesn't like the, the unit economics, so. After a year and a half, do, do you still like the unit economics of, uh, of dining reservations? Well, I love that business. <laughs> and, and the core business is as healthy as it's ever been. It's growing very fast. Um, but our aspiration for Open Table is not to be a US-based, high-end restaurant booking service. Like, our aspiration is for it to be global, for it to go into casual dining, to address the performance of the model. But we have such a solid base. But the reason we bought it was for the bigger picture. We want OpenTable to be the booking.com of the restaurant industry. And we just introduced Krista Quarles as the new CEO of OpenTable. We've made some management changes. And I'll, back on stage a year from now, we'll talk a little bit about the progress we made. Because we've got big plans. We're investing heavily uh, in the platform. And we love it. And it fits our model well. The challenge with OpenTable is not international. So if you do book as an, a Brit and you're going to New York, you get plenty of marketing from Booking.com. We show you restaurants in your insider guide. We promote the app on your pre-trip email. When you land, we push the restaurants around your hotel. So we're doing lots of that. It's not as open because they don't have restaurants in many other parts of the world. And we have a, still a lot of work ahead of us. But of all the businesses we have in our portfolio, it's one that I look at and, and still have the biggest you know, the, I could see potential that is just amazing. Even though today it's our smallest brand, it's a brand that's really loved by people, and, and we've got a lot of things happening. Darren, a question from the audience here. Sure. Hey, Mark. Hey, hey Darren. Uh, yesterday, Dara talked about investing in areas where the market has moved away from, and you mentioned air. And uh, in international markets, how do you think about air today? I think I ask you this question every few years. But yeah. do you think that there's something that's changed and that's created a greater cross-sell opportunity that you didn't need in the past, but maybe you'll need going forwards? Uh, I don't think anything's changed, <laughs> to be honest. If anything, it's, it's not a great, you know, we have an OTA business at Priceline. Sure, there's some cross-sell potential, et cetera. But our biggest air business is Kayak. That business I like. That's, that's Air Meta. It does a lot of business, gets done direct with the airlines, not necessarily through an OTA. The OTAs pick up a little business on the side. And, and the airlines like Kayak. And I think that's a great way for us to align ourselves. We also, by the way, have over 100 airline partners who cross-sell Booking.com hotels. It's the biggest portfolio of airlines. So in a way, we're monetizing airlines' direct sites 
through fan, you know, Ryanair, EasyJet, Wizz Air, go, go down all the European airlines now all using Booking.com, but also the OTAs, Odigio, you know, uh, Skyscanner, et cetera. So, so that's our play in air. It's not a direct play to become, you know, the best ticketing um, player. And Expedia has a much bigger presence there, but we, we like where we're focusing. We're not ignoring air, but we're getting at it in a different way. So you, you like hotels, you like private accommodations, you're not so big on, on air, yeah. uh, you like dining. Yeah. What, what, are some, what are some other aspects, maybe from thinking about the consumer yeah. Yeah. traveler experience, what are some big opportunities, some pain points, some frictions that the industry yeah. should really be thinking about? Well, you know, uh, the mission of the group is helping people experience the world. And when you go out to experience the world, what do you do? You move, you sleep, you eat, and you do stuff. Okay? And the eating and the sleeping, we're, we have quite strong positions on. Even the moving, we have the rental car business. We have this discussion around flights. Maybe there's other things to move. Um, I think activities is a really interesting area, which is the doing stuff. Uh, we're trying some things, cross-selling some things, but I don't think anyone's really cracked the code yet. Uh, my gut is it's more, it's not something you think, like when you're booking travel, you got to do it in pieces. You know, it's hard to book an airline ticket. And then you got your accommodation, you just need to rest a little bit. You need to go away, think about it, but you don't really want to book your restaurant like three months ahead. But a week before, you're starting to think, okay, we're going to land at six o'clock, the kids are going to be cranky. You know, where are we going to eat? And you're starting to think about the really practical things. And on, we're there Monday. What do you think we're going to do on Tuesday? Hop on, hop off bus, canal boat. Like, so that's the moment. And often it doesn't even happen until you're in destination. And the challenge and the opportunity, I think, is mobile and payments. And what if when you land, you haven't made, figured anything out, but we say, hey, go to the Rikes Museum, skip the line, go around the corner, and Frank House. Great, we got a deal for you. Come in here, don't stand in line. Like that kind of stuff is where where I have a lot of passion and I think we have an opportunity somewhere down the road to crack the code on the, on the broader experience that customers are having in destination. One more well, question from the audience. Sure. Hello, Darren. Um, as you know, outside the United States, 70% of the accommodation properties are small, yeah. medium. They're independents and they're struggling. Yeah. So what's your advice to them on how to build a business that thrives, how to make money, how to generate yield in the face of particularly this consolidation that's going on? Yeah, that's funny. It's, it's, you say they're struggling, but I think what's happened, I, I know many, many successful small independent accommodations. The world has become more democratic in the information that gets shared. And my recommendation is run a great property like really run a great property and differentiate yourself and then leverage the power of platforms like Booking.com or Expedia because they can bring the world to your doorstep. You don't need a big marketing department. You don't need a sales force. What you need to do is run a great property. The other thing, there's been a ton of innovation in tools. You know, we have Booking Suite, there's other products. Soon we'll have an entire software stack in the cloud where you could run your property for amazingly low cost. You can get a free website, you can have property management tools, we can help you price your product, but then just run a great property. And I'm actually very optimistic for the small independent property, but in the, in the world of the future, it's gonna be about quality of experience and differentiation. If you have those two things, I think you're well set up for success in the future. So, uh, Darren, there's one question that I really would like to ask you, but I know you can't answer it, and that yeah. is, what companies would you like to acquire? So I'm going to ask a slightly different okay, question. Okay, thank so, you. So let's say, let's say, given all the consolidation, uh, the Priceline Group gets acquired. You're out of a job. Any company in the world that you could run, which would it be? I'd run Open Table. I have to say, I tell Chris this all the time, but I love that business. And I've had a great run at Booking.com. And I still love the scale, but that's a company that I, I just have. I mean, what's not to like about the restaurant space? So that's my, it's a. It'd be a little bit of a, of a step down, wouldn't it? I mean. Hey, I would do that. I, I'm a hands-on guy. I'm not a, I'm not a public company guy, really, at my heart. I love the day-to-day -day work. That's what I, you know, I look forward to leaving this conference, getting back to Amsterdam and sitting with the teams and thinking up new stuff and innovations and leveraging data and all that. That's what I get a, have a lot of passion for. And, uh. Okay, well, the non-public, public company guy, Mr. Exactly. Houston. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.